it to make sure we are on Facebook and it's working properly. Oh, Ooh, good idea. I'll grab my phone so I can use my phone to cheat with Facebook too. <laughs> yeah, it is now live. Yay! Hey, Benjamin, thank you for watching us. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining me for another episode of Hollywood Kitchen. As I've been mentioning, I'm trying to do as many of these as I can while the weather is not 100 degrees and it's still comfortable to make food in my kitchen. So one of the things that I love about Hollywood is that it's such a cultural melting pot and there's people that have come here from all over the globe and brought their influence both artistically and aesthetically and in terms of food. So Hollywood is made up of so many different incredible people from everywhere. And so tonight we have a special episode. We are gonna talk about Carmen Miranda as part of the Luso World Blogathon hosted by my dear friend, Beth Gowder. Beth, if you've ever seen TCM over the last several years, you have seen Beth on TCM. She is in the Backlot promotional. She's a super TCM fan. She has been a blogger since 2008, Spellbound by Louise, and she is all around a fantastic lady, and I'm so happy to have her here. Hi, Carrie. Thank you so much for having me. It's a delight to be uh, on Hollywood Kitchen. I've had a lot of fun watching your episodes and hearing about the different stars and celebrities that everyone is so knowledgeable about. Well, thank you. And, you know, I'm going to learn a lot tonight, Beth, to be honest, because, you know, we all, I think most of us have a film history blind spot or maybe a star or era or a thing that we're just not as familiar with as others. And in my case, I really don't know that much about Carmen Miranda. And this is a terrific opportunity to correct that. So I am looking really forward to, um, to talking about her. One of the questions I always ask all my guests at first is how you first knew about this star? Like, when did you first discover the work? And that's kind of hard to answer with Carmen because she's such a part of popular culture. I think there are people out there who don't even know who she is, but know her image. Um, it, it's gotta be from TV and a classic movie on TV. And of course, I finally knew about her from uh, Radio Days, Woody Allen's film, where there's a tribute to her in, in the movie. But she's been in uh, parodied or paid tribute to in other TV shows and, and movies and things. For example, even Elvis got into the act. And in one of Elvis's movies, he does a, a Carmen Miranda parody. <laughs> I think my first exposure to Carmen, um, which I've talked about on a lot of these episodes, like the Marilyn Monroe one with Benjamin, there's a lot of these stars. I knew the image before I knew the person, before I knew the work. And I remember seeing her, um, Mickey Rooney, I think it's Babes on Broadway. He gets dressed up in the full Carmen Miranda and does a Carmen Miranda dance. So I think that was actually my first exposure to her. And then like everybody, I had just seen the big fruit headdress, the platform heels, which Anybody that can dance in platform heels and a giant headdress has my undying respect. <laughs> but I knew the image first, and so I think that's probably the case for just about everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, even with Chiquita Banana, Chiquita Banana is based on Carmen Miranda. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So another thing I've always heard about her is she's South American and Brazilian, but she was technically born in Portugal. So... Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, if I could backtrack one second and explain what this whole Luzo thing is. Oh, um, oh please, yes. I think it's a good opportunity in, in bringing up both Portugal and Brazil. Um, Portugal became a nation in about the 12th century, but before that, um, when it was a peninsula and it had different provinces and things like that, um, at one point it was conquered by the Romans, who named the whole Iberian Peninsula Hispania, and they named the part of what would become, mostly what would become modern-day Portugal, Lusitania. So Lusitania was a, a, a Roman state of Hispania, and a lot of different tribes, Visigoths, other groups, all came through the Iberian um, Peninsula, but the Lusitanians were a Celt Iberian tribe that had settled in that Lusitania area. 
And so that's where the Romans grabbed the name from. Now, um, the Portuguese do see the Lusitanians, which is a Celt-Iberian tribe, as one of their uh, spiritual ancestors. So they take that loose and, and turn it into the uh, prefix Luzo. And basically, Luzo is used in front of different words um, to indicate its connection to Portugal, Portuguese language, uh, Portuguese culture, or Portuguese influence cultures. And so Lusophone is somebody who speaks Portuguese. Um, Lusitanic cultures is what you can call all the cultures throughout the world that were um, uh, affected, changed, became Portuguese speaking um, cultures because of their contact with Portugal. There are positives. Some of it was trade and ex friendly exploration and, and uh, non-coercive missionary work. But on the, on the darker side, there was colonization and slavery and religious wars as, as, as well. So Brazil is a Portuguese speaking country. So it's a Lusitanic culture. The people there are Lusophones. Um, and it was a colony of Portugal and it was a country that received the majority of Portugal's transatlantic slave trade. So por between Portugal and the Portuguese that became Brazilians, 4.9 million Africans were imported to Bra Brazil, which kind of jump-started some of uh, what became the later diversity in Brazil. Um, but Brazil eventually became an independent country in 1822. And then even though it had become an independent country, it was a, a Portuguese speaking country. Uh, they do have a variation in accent and tempo and some grammar and some phrases and words than uh, European Portuguese. But for people in Portugal, who were looking for a better life and a way to find somewhere that had new opportunities, going and moving to parts of the former current Portuguese empire was a way where they could go to a new land and try a new start. Um, life could be very hard in Portugal if you were among the poor and the uneducated. Social mobility at one point was very, very hard. Um, education of the common man was not a priority. Portugal was slow to industrialize, so the increase in income from industrialization didn't, didn't happen um, as fast for Portugal as, as other countries. So you have Carmen Miranda, and she was born February 9th, 1909, so she was born after Brazil's independence, um, and her father was one of those people who were part of the economic Portuguese diaspora who went abroad to Brazil to try to make a better life for his family. Now he left first. And so he left um, his wife, he left uh, Carmen, and he left her older sister, Olinda, all back in Portugal. Well, Carmen's mother did get a little, a little nervous about that. Um, you know, long separations across an ocean aren't really good for marriage. So she packed up and, and moved the, her two children and joined her husband in Brazil. And they eventually had four more children, including Aurora. And I can get back to Aurora in, in, in a little bit, but Aurora does play a role in Carmen's career. But I do want to say what Carmen's real birth name is. Her real birth name is Maria do Carmo Miranda da Cunha. So that's her real first name. Miranda is a, a maternal surname and da Cunha is the father's paternal surname um, on that part of it. And she, even though her first name was Maria, she was nicknamed Carminha or Carmen for two reasons. Her family thought she looked Spanish and her father loved Bizet's opera, Carmen. And so that's how she got her, her nickname, Carmen. Um, can we make the uh, drink and then talk a little bit about this item? I have to admit, I have never had this before. So tell me how to pronounce it so I don't do it incorrectly. 
Well, and I have to confess, even though I'm half Portuguese, I'm the second generation on the Portuguese side of my family not to have been taught it by the older generation. And here's a complicating factor. Um, some of my family came from Northern Portugal um, and some came from the Azores and some came from Madeira. Those are three different accents. I grew up in an area where one of the majority accents was Azorean Portuguese for the accent and Brazilian has its own accent. So I promise no perfection, but um, it, in honor of, of my heritage and of honor of the Portuguese speakers in the, in the world, let, let, I'll give it a try and say creme de abacate. Okay, so it basically, we got the recipe, you found this recipe and brought it to my attention. This originally ran in an issue of Modern Screen Magazine, right, in 1944? Mm -hmm. It did, yes. And it was one of those features uh, where they, they, you, they wanted you to get to know the star, humanize the star, and of course, Carmen was connecting with people through, through music and her performance. So they figured, oh, let's also connect them with her food. Because what have, have we seen? One of the greatest ways of acceptance uh, of uh, other cultures is, le is learning to acclimate to things like their food as well. That makes perfect sense. And I know Modern Screen had a column like Modern Screen, Modern Hostess. So they really promoted the cooking, kitchen, and home and lifestyle aspect of the stars. Yes. And, and in that particular issue of the magazine, they emphasized how Carmen was, uh, a, hmm, how do I want to phrase this? The, how she was almost like a compulsive co coffee drinker, and that was the Brazilian way. And also, uh, they featured a, a beef and bean dish. Um, but in choosing this recipe, I thought the creme de abacate would be a good one to share because it's easy to make, it's easy to get the ingredients, it's tasty, and it also highlights how um, Brazilians like to use avocado as a sweet. A lot of Americans think of it as being in things that are savory, like guacamole, unless you also like sometimes like smoothies and put your avocado in smoothies. But in Brazil, it's, it's often a treat to, to have an avocado dish. So we've got two chilled avocados, which I've already kind of cut up here. We've got a lime, which I have cut up into four sections. We have about a half cup. You can use milk or almond milk. I've got almond milk here. The recipe called for three tablespoons of sugar. I may mess with the sugar levels and kind of see how it tastes for me. And then, of course, the lime zest. You can also use lemon, it said on the recipe too, but I, I like lime. And, and what I would recommend is if you're going to do the, the zest, um, to make sure that you get an organic lime or lemon. Oh, I did. Oh, perfect. Good. <laughs> okay. So this is the first time I've used my blender on Hollywood Kitchen. If it's obnoxiously loud, I totally apologize for that. So, okay. Guess I'm going to put the avocado into the blender. I don't have a mini food processor, but I'm told a blender will also work just fine. Okay. So we're going to add the almond milk. I'm going to do maybe a third of this sugar and again, kind of see how the taste works out for me here. And then the lime. I'd be curious to see how this tastes. Again, this is something I have never, ever had before. This is entirely new to me. But it's really fun to discover new cultures, especially, of course, through food. And okay, it's about 50% of a line here. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right, prepare for the noise. I think I need to stir it a little because not all the avocado is kind of getting mixed in here. It looks, let's see. 
looks super, super thick. I'm kind of wondering if I need to up the almond milk. It's, it's supposed to be pudding-like. It's supposed to be. Oh, okay. I was thinking more like smoothie you drink like. Oh. You're supposed to eat it with a spoon. I didn't know that. Okay, that, that actually makes sense. Then. Let me, I'll be right back. Let me go get a, a cup to put it in for, the, for that. Okay. I somehow must have misunderstood and thought it was like a smoothie kind of thing. Okay. Okay, put a little bit of the zest on top. All right, and here is what the final result looks like. And I think I might even eat this on camera while you, uh, while you talk about Carmen Miranda for us. Oh, sure. So, uh, so in, in talking about Carmen, um, I know like with, with your audience, a lot of people have seen the films. So I was thinking that, that uh, what I could contribute is, you know, talking about some of her biography and in the cultural background. Um, now, sometimes there's a myth with Carmen Miranda where, um, in typical Hollywood fashion, the publicists like to give stars a different background. So a lot of times um, with Carmen, they do refer to her as being middle class. But if she had been middle class, her family would have never immigrated to Brazil. They would have been comfortable in Portugal. Um, and so when the father immigrated to Brazil, he set up a barber shop. And Carmen did receive an education, but she received an education for free. She was educated at the convent of uh, Santa Teresina in Lapa, the Rio de Janeiro neighborhood where her family lived. And that was run by the Sisters of Charity and the institution provided the education for free for the local neighbor girls. Um, and then as she got older and out of school, she had various jobs. She was, uh, worked in a haberdasher shop a boutique where she learned the skill of hat making. And then eventually she opened up her own milliner's shop featuring the hats she made herself, something that would come in handy later for her performing career, being able to fabricate and make designs of, of hats and uh, turbans and other costumes. I have to you say, know. oh, what was it? This is really good. Yeah, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's so simple, but tasty. Oh my gosh, I love discovering a new thing. Um, and I'm actually glad in my case, I mean, everybody can adjust it to their own taste buds, but I'm kind of glad I didn't use a ton of sugar because I kind of, I don't like stuff that's so sweet. It's like drinking a, or eating a cup of bubble gum or something. Do you know what I mean? Like, I kind of like stuff a little, I don't know. I think more is less sometimes when it comes to mm -hmm. sugar, but mm, really good. Mm. At some point, um, Carmen's parents' marriage dissolved. The father had at least one, one serious affair. The mother really became the breadwinner from the family, plus Car whatever Carmen could make and the, and the other, ch other children. Um, to have an income at one point, the mother started a boarding house. I've also seen it referenced as an inn in some places. And while Carmen enjoyed performing at school, when some of when people asked some of her um some of the people who knew her when she was a child about how amazing her performances must have been as a child um that was not what they said but she got more experience performing um at her her mother's place um for the diners and the boarders and that really helped her because one night there was um Annabelle Duarte, or I grew up saying Duarte, but he was there and he was able to introduce her based on what he saw to uh, Josu de, de Barros. And that was a composer, a musician, and he immediately invited her to participate in a charity fest festival at the National Institute of Music. And for somebody interested in music, um, performing for free at charity events is, is a great way to get your, your foot in the door. And so when she started out, she was singing things like uh, tangos and, and, and marshas, carnival music, and things like that. Well, um, 
Josu invited her to record one some songs. And the first song she recorded, Now Va Simbora and Sa Osamba I Molda, um, were released in 1929, but they didn't receive much fanfare. Um, so they kind of just were released and, and, and went away. But another recording that she did, Pravose Gosta de Mim, um, or sometimes called Tai, that was a march especially composed for her by Joubert de Cavallo, and it sold 35,000 copies. And suddenly Carmen was a recording star in Brazil because of that. And one of the, she was very savvy career-wise. And so she made many recordings, hundreds of recordings in, in Brazil eventually. But when she signed her first record contract, it was with RCA Victor in 1930, and she signed a two-year exclusivity. So here's the brilliant move. She gets extra money for it being exclusive, but it expires after a while. So if her career continues on the upward trajectory, she can then negotiate a better contract in two, in two years. And she jumped around from record label to record label. She was also the first Brazilian radio artist to have an exclusive contract and she participated in the first sound and musical films in Brazil. She traveled all over Brazil to Argentina, to Chile, and Uruguay. Um, and you know, at one point, Uruguay had actually been part of Brazil until some international borders were changed. She also, at this point, was already very conscientious about her image and making sure she had original costumes. And that also helped her get published in magazines and the fans started copying her. Um, eventually, this would be called the Miranda look, the look that she was developing between now and, and a little bit later. Um, she had some great nicknames, Pequena Notaval, Little Remarkable, now excuse my pronunciations, please, Ambestrix do Samba, Samba Ambassador, Estrella Maxima, Maximum Star, Reina do Samba, Queen of Samba, a pequeño do the little do it, and Dictadora Rizania do Samba, Samba's giggle dictator. So those were so many affectionate names that the Brazilians were giving her because she became so beloved. It was in 1939 when she really hit upon that Bayana look. And so that's when she adopted a look that you could find in uh, Bahia, which was um, Portugal's most Africanized state at the time. The, a flowing dress and a fruit hat turban were basically the style, but Miranda made it look very glamorous. Instead of, you know, being something that was like a daily wear, she made it into uh, fancy club performance wear. And she eventually became the singer at uh, a glamorous uh, night spot in Rio called Casino of Erca. And she performed there through the 30s and 40s. Um, she was the main performer. She was there during a golden era. Well, Carmen is doing so well that um, one night, who's there but Lee Schubert, so the producer and the theater owner, He's there with his guest, Sonia Henney, and they catch Carmen's performance. And Sonia Henney basically says to him, if you don't sign this girl, I will. And so he signs her to a limited term contract to appear in 1939 in his Broadway musical, The Streets of Paris. And Schubert figured the risk was worth it either way. He wasn't really sure what people would think of this short, Latin type singing um, in a foreign language, but there was a World's Fair going on at the time. So he thought anything I can do uh, to bring talent in that could be of interest to compete with the World's Fair, let's do it. Carmen did it. She helped put that show on the map, even though she didn't really receive billing like other stars on the bill like Evan and Costello. And she had maybe like six minutes or so, or so initially on the bill. She was she was the main one that all the reviews were talking about 
even the even some of the reviews where they weren't quite sure what to make of her, they talked about her impact. Um, so that helped her. Now, Carmen was loyal to her band, and she did ask Lee Schubert to hire her band, Bando Dalua, and he would only hire the band if she would pay them out of her own money that she was paid for the show. Now that's, so, I've heard that like Schubert really dealt very poorly uh, with Carmen and especially kind of screwed over financially and uh, assuming that she didn't know any better. Is that, is that the case? Well, I would say she, based on how she worked her way through with contracts through in Brazil that, that she could be savvy, but the thing to her disadvantage in negotiating in America or the United States was the fact that she was unknown there. She had a decade's worth of success in Brazil. But the average uh, American didn't have any idea that this was a, some famous person coming here and that she was a talented person. Well, she so didn't she, have leverage yet. Yeah, she knew she was starting over from scratch. And so, you know, in order to keep her band, she agreed to things like paying for the band out of her own salary. Now, whether she asked for the salary to be increased to pay for the band, I don't know. I, I, don't, I haven't found a record of that, but... That would have been a savvy move. <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, her performing uh, on Broadway and in nightclubs, uh, is, it's kind of funny because Carmen, Carmen would kind of double book herself or where sometimes she would be performing like in a Broadway show or in another city and she'd be on stage performing in a production, but she'd also book nightclub acts um, for the same evening. So you have Carmen running around from performance venue to performance venue. And you, sometimes you could say that it was m motivated by her early poverty to make this money when, when she can. Um, and, and it's also kind of like um, a Portuguese American stereotype that they're, they're hard workers. Like what, what do you do to relax? Oh, I go do work at home. And so it's, it's, a, it's a little cultural, cultural thing maybe too, but she was driven. She was driven. And so in 1940, she got her contract with 20th Century Fox. And, and part of the allure for uh, the studio to sign her was the push um, to promote the good neighbor policy. Um, you know, when things were, were looking a little iffy abroad in, in, in Europe, um, and then we had neighbors to the south, um, there, was a, there were multiple reasons why to make sure the neighbors were good. In the name of friendly borders, in the name of, of trade, in, in the name of making sure that, that um, nothing would become um, politicized in a negative way that would hurt the United States relations with um, Latin America. And so she was hired in. She had her first film, Down Argentine Way, which was had also been a Broadway triumph. And she, you know, was a sensation. She was a hit, which led to a series of, of films being made and the creation of the Brazilian bombshell. Uh, if you look at Carmen's outfits, um, you know, she, she does hit play these flirty kind of characters with these kind of uh, names like Chiquita and Rosita. So she, that are, are, are kind of cutesy. Um, and really, if you, I, I looked at quite a few of her costumes um, from pictures from the Carmen Miranda Museum. And I, I didn't really think about like how many times she was wearing a, a bustier with a skirt. So she was showing quite a bit of sk a skin too. So Brazilian bombshell, were they talking about temperament or were they talking about how much flesh that she was actually showing too? Um, and so by now there's the Miranda look. She's doing this uh, Bahian look based on the, Af the Afro-Brazilian women of Bahia. And she's got spangles, she's got uh, ruffles. And one of her signature pieces of the Miranda look was the platform pump, which was inspired by Portuguese clogs. Also, Carmen was quite short. She was under five feet. Sometimes you see her credited as being five foot two, 
I think that was probably when they measured her with her platforms on. <laughs> she was under or under five feet. So, you know, they generally talk about her being under five feet and 100 pounds or less. Um, so even though she's this big presence on the screen, physically, she is very little. And even before she was famous, she was very much into wearing costume jewelry for her performances. So once she was more successful, um, she was able to specify the designs of the costume jewelry and have it specially made for her. And then the turbans were part of the buy-in look that she had incorporated. But in her Hollywood movies, it was just taken to a completely diff different level until um, we see her as the lady in the tutti frutti uh, hat, and I'm just not sure how big that hat is supposed to be in the gang's all here. It seems to go into infinity on 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 screen. And that was Busby Berkeley directed gang's all here, right? It was, yes. Um, and so, on on the sadder note of things, you know, she had friendships with black and what was called back then mulatto. We would say mixed race musicians, um, and unfortunately, Hollywood pressured her to change the composition of her band. And so, studio ex executives basically gave the note that they wanted a more Latin looking band. And by what they meant by that was they wanted a band that looked more Mexican and not so much mixed race um, in, in the group members. And so unfortunately, one thing you would see with the change of the of Banda de Lua is the composition of the people changed and not because of musicianship, unfortunately, with her Hollywood collaboration. Um, so here she is. Merch. At one point, she's the highest paid woman in Hollywood. She's making a lot of money, working hard, doing films, doing nightclub acts, making recordings. And then in March of 1941, she became the first Latin American artist to print her feet and hands on the sidewalk at Grauman's Chinese Theater. So That's she had, first, yeah. Um, another first that she would have, and I believe this was posthumously, she was the first South American to have a gold star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Now, I, 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 in, the, in the notes it says South American, so there must have been another Latin American performer who beat her to getting the star, um, but wasn't from South America. Now, one of the things that happened to Carmen that was very, very wounding was she had all this success abroad and some of, the, uh, some of the people back home in Brazil and other people in Latin America, they did um, have criticisms about what was being portrayed on screen. Um, a lot of Lat Latin America um, speaks Spanish uh, you know, Brazil is, is one of the exceptions on that. Um, and uh, there are other countries that speak f French. When Carmen portrayed these different characters in the movies, sometimes she would be playing a, a, a character that should be singing in Spanish, but she's singing in Portuguese. So sometimes she's singing a samba when she should be singing a tango or a rumba. And so the Good Neighbor films kind of made a generic Pan-American composite of, of, of Latin Americans. And so it was supposed to inspire good, goodwill, but it did leave people feeling like they were uh, misunderstood in, in not getting accurate representation. Meanwhile, Americans were, were loving the portrayals and not really understanding why they, not understanding that they could fall wrong or hit wrong. So that was kind of hard for her. Um, and when she went back to Brazil, she performed at her former nightclub, uh, Urca, and she got a very chilly reception. Um, so it, in some cases, it could be about the reaction to the film, but a lot of people also think it was due to the bill she put together. It was a mishmash of the kind of bill she would have done for Americans. So she had Brazilian songs, she had Tin Pan Alley songs in English. Um, she just, and she would just jump all, all around. And 
it didn't seem like the to the Brazilian audience that this performance had been designed for them. It just seemed more of what she was doing for the for the Americans to them. And it really, really hurt Carmen bad. It would be 14 to 15 years until she returned to Brazil. And she also recorded a slapback song. So I heard slapback, about that. yes, slapback songs are not new to rap. They've been around for a long time. And so her slapback song was Dizarum Ke U Voltai American Zada. They say I came back Americanized. And so if you Google that song online and look at the lyrics, you can see where she's scoffing that she's Americanized. Um, she's uh, also making fun of things in Brazilian culture that can be poked fun at. And so if you're Brazilian, you know that she's teasing or mocking you back after the chilly reception that, that she got. Um, the other thing that kind of happened too over time with Miranda was, okay, she's Portuguese. So she's a European woman. That means she's a white woman. She's a white Brazilian. Um, and so she got famous per performing, uh, you know, the samba when she switched to sambas as her focus. Originally sambas uh, were viewed as more like a, a black music, something that came from from the slums. And so the the plus side of it was in her uh, bringing this music to to wider appeal and presenting it to to audiences, she helped remove the negativity about the music. At the same time, when you get people who talk about cultural appropriation, um, there are, are militant uh, Afro-Brazilians who, who critique this very negatively. Um, for me personally, I, I truly do think she loved the music. She loved performing it. She loved spreading it. I think she was fascinated with the, what she saw was, was an innate uh, glamour to the self-presentation of the buying woman. Um, so I, I think it was on her part, not so much exploitation, but um, presenting something that she loved and was, was fascinated by. Plus, the way something is perceived today versus the way it might be perceived back then is also, you know, very different. Yeah, and, and I kind of, uh, I, I really like a quote by a person who ended up writing a musical about Carmen Miranda uh, called South American Way, the Carmen Miranda musical. Um, her admirers today prefer to see Miranda as the Brazilian equivalent of Elvis Presley, a white man who sings black music and takes it to a larger audience. Yes, she was a European with green eyes who sang black music, but that is one of the reasons the upper classes attacked her. We had a very colonized mentality at the time and Samba was seen as being a thing from the slums for and by blacks and not proper. And so I kind of like that because I think if, <laughs> You can, it can get really complicated when you talk about cultural appropriation, but if music is good, if music is beautiful, it can tra transcend the different boundaries. And if, if you love it, if it's in your heart and you're doing it in a non-exploitive, loving way, I, I, that's what I feel Carmen did. I, I really think that she really enjoyed it like that. And then uh, one of the other criticisms that um, Carmen suffered from Brazilians was she was not a true Brazilian. And that gets a little BS because Brazil does have a lot of similarities to the United States. It was originally a colony, well, it became a colony of a European nation. In this case, it was Portugal instead of England. Um, there were indigenous that did not get great treatment. There were imported Af uh, Africans, like I said, f through slavery and forced to labor. Um, and that was 4.9 million people, 40% of the transatlantic slave trade. In comparison, the U.S. slave trade was 12% of the Brazilian slave trade. So between four, maybe about, we could round it up to about 600,000 people. Um, and Brazil is a very, very big country. Um, and so then you have, you know, the waves of settlers from 
from the colonizing uh, nation, but then you have the waves of immigrants um, continuing through this day. And so it, it really seems anti-immigrant to say that Carmen wasn't a true Brazilian because she immigrated when she was maybe about a year old and Brazil was the only country she knew. She loved Brazil as her homeland, uh, spiritually and culturally. She was culturally Brazilian, even if she never became a naturalized citizen. So she remained a Portuguese citizen until she died. That was what her passport was. Um, yet, so there is some irony that somebody who didn't have a Brazilian passport is one of two of the most famous people to ever come out of Brazil, the other being um, the soccer player Pele. What, uh, what are your favorite Carmen Miranda films and which ones do you think kind of stand, stand out the most in her filmography? Oh my goodness. Well, I mean, um, I do like Down Argentine Way and The Gang's All Here. Um, you know, I think those are, are two of my favorites. I really love seeing her with Alice Faye. Um, one thing that's enheartening for, for about the movies she did with Alice Faye at 20th Century Fox is the two women were became real friends and they adored each other. And Alice Faye said that Carmen was beautiful inside and out. And even though, you know, Carmen was reduced to the, to the friend or the sidekick or the performer in a lot of these movies, even if she was billed first, um, you know, there's something uh, nice about knowing that these magical moments she created on screen also created these behind the scenes uh, friendships. Even Vivian Blaine, who didn't really seem to get her completely, um, had nothing bad to say about her. Um, Vivian Blaine, who worked with her in the 20th Century Fox musicals, um, was quoted as, I'll say this for Carmen Miranda. She was a marvelous person and a, a, with a great sense of humor, and she supported her family back home. She was very good to them. And, and so here we have, it, it, it just makes watching these movies a lot more fun to know that it was a good behind the scenes to take it as well. Um, and a still a little, uh, still a little uh, funny though to think of uh, uh, her her song routine in the gangs all here with the bananas. <laughs> well, um, what book would you recommend about Carmen if someone wanted to learn a lot more about her? Assuming most of her movies are available on DVD or TCM. That's a little hard, you know. Um, some of the books on Carmen are are out of print. Um, so if you're and one of the ones that's in print on her is very academic. Um, what I can do is when you post this video, I can put a little bibliography of recommended titles um, for people and I can list what's in print and what's out of print for them in the comments. That'd be great because, uh, you know, since the pandemic is still raging, it's always good to recommend movies or books or something people can, you know, turn to if they want to learn more. Yeah. So I, I will have to say one sad thing about for, with Carmen Miranda is um, uh, when the war was over and the Cold War started to become a focus, that was towards the end of her big film career. Um, good Neighbor films were not the priority anymore and they also weren't making as much money. So then she concentrated on nightclub and television performances. So she didn't start working, um, but you know, maybe she wasn't on screen like she used to be. Uh, I can say one of the things uh, about her is by 1945, she was making more than 200,000 annually. So towards the, towards the end of the Good Neighbor films, she had quite a good income and she was known as being one of the women's women of the of the country to pay the highest in taxes um during one film copacabana she did meet um her husband and they he was an assistant producer in the film um and she married sebastian um unfortunately the marriage didn't ultimately work out they stayed married till they died, but it had a lot of ups and downs. And by the end of the marriage, they were in separate bedrooms, which is part of an issue with when she eventually passed away that I'll get to. Um, and then, um, so in 1954, she finally returned to Brazil. 
and enough time had passed that she received the welcome that she wished she had received in the 40s. So she finally, you know, got the kind of homecoming to her homeland that gave, that she needed. Um, and her marriage wasn't great at that time. Her husband, you know, was making sure she worked a lot and she was already a driven person working, working a lot. And so this time in Brazil came when she needed a health break. She wasn't doing well health-wise in 1954. Um, you know, overwork, exhaustion, um, some dependence on, um, on uh, substances that kept her going or, or, or let her sleep. It was, it was a really hard time. And then unfortunately by, by 1955, um, Carmen would pass away. Her, her last recorded performance was on the Jimmy Durante show and the two of them were friends. And uh, on YouTube, somebody has posted the, the, this episode because at first they wanted to figure out what to do because basically on August 4th, she recorded this performance and by the morning of August 5th, she was known to be dead. And they decided to present the performance uh, they had recorded because that's what Carmen would have wanted. And I think it is true. That's what she, she would have wanted. There she was with her good friend performing on the show and, and having a fun time. Um, watching it, knowing that she died afterwards, um, there are things that you can see. There's one um, number where she's in the buy-in costume and she's dancing with Jimmy Durante and he very gallantly pretends that he needs a break. During the dance routine, she actually is moving awkwardly at times and at one point she sinks to her knees and she sinks to her knees and she's out of breath. Um, so that was probably already signs of, of the, the heart attack that was coming. And how old um, was she? What was it? How old was she at the time? 46. Oh, yeah, she, she was 46 years old. Um, and so Jimmy pretended that he needed a break. And, and, and while he was doing the break, uh, uh, you can see Carmen gasping for breath. And she, mentioned, she mentions that. But being the person she was, being so driven, being so people oriented, it wasn't enough to do the show. She actually invited people from the show and friends back to her home and she entertained them. Um, and so basically she was, she, she, perpetual motion was, was kind of talked about her trademark. So it was finally 3 a.m. when she and her husband went to bed um, after she entertained people, after already entertaining people on the Jimmy Durante show. And they went to, to bed in, in their separate bedrooms. Um, when Carmen was found in the morning, uh, they kind of figured out what had happened. They could tell that she had gone to the bathroom to, to fix her face, to you know, take off her show makeup. They found a cigarette in the ashtray she must have left and she, she basically collapsed on the way back from her bathroom to her bedroom while holding a little small mirror. And they found her on the floor um, in the hallway at 10.30 a.m. when it was her husband who found her. And so it's a really sad way for somebody who was so exuberant and, and given, giving and driven to to you know, pass away by, by her, herself like that and not be noticed right away. Um, you know, so I don't wanna end on a sad note. So our, let's, I wanna talk about her, her legacy now. Like I said, if you think of celebrities from Brazil, Pele and Carmen Miranda are the two that the world knows. Um, she's so well known that there are parodies of her in TV shows, in movies. Cartoons cartoons. Yes, Bugs Bunny, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and she's a classic Halloween costume. Um, there's a museum in Rio dedicated just to her. Um, there's been a musical uh, written about her that I mentioned, the S South American Way, the Carmen Miranda musical. There's also a documentary on her that's fictionalized in some ways. Uh, for example, they have a drag queen portray Carmen. And it's called Bananas is My Business. 
um, that documentary kind of features Carmen as a as a as a martyr to the good neighbor policy and to her performance. Um, but it, it's provocative and, and, and good. I, I caught it when it first aired on PBS and it is available out there on disc, but it's slowly disappearing. Um, I think it was uh, maybe either Fox or Kino Lorber put, put out the dispersion of that. Um, so what I would really wanna focus on for Carmen is the joy and the entertainment that she gave so many people and the delight she took in per performing and, and designing her costumes and, 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 and giving and, and getting that love back from, from the audience. Um, you know, she, she dealt with prejudice in different ways from different people. She dealt with rejection in different ways from, from, from different people. Um, she didn't have a happy romantic life, but she has this career that lasts beyond her that people who especially love things like Turner Classic Movies and get a chance to delve into her filmography, we, we can enjoy that and hopefully keep spreading it to the other generations. And of course, there are so many recordings of her out there. If people want to pursue listening to her musical career, they can, can do that as well. Um, so that might be an area that some people have under underexplored her, her Brazilian era, say, that they can have access to. Yeah. You want to take some questions? See if anybody on Facebook has questions for us? Sure. Okay. Also, I, I'll, while you do that, I'll, sh I'll show this. I, I bought this fairly recently, the Carmen Miranda collection. This is disappearing and not, it's not manufactured anymore. The only places that I found have this are uh, discount dealers on Amazon Marketplace. So if you would like to find Carmen Miranda videos, I would say snatch them up because um, this one was put out by Fox. There was also one that was put out by um, Eureka that has commentary from, uh, from uh, Farron Neme Smith. Um, that one looks like it's not in production anymore too, but you can snap it up places uh, as well. Let's see. Did the musical, Danny Miller is asking, did the musical about her ever get produced? Yes, it got produced and it, it got performed. There, there is a different man who's written a different production about her, um, who, who uh, goes by the name Joe, Joe Lopez, um, and his has not come out, but that, that South American Wave musical played New York, um, and uh, the people who put it together were interviewed by the New York Times. Okay. That's the only question I'm seeing pop up on here, but this has been fascinating. And I think Danny's right. This is so ripe for a biopic. There's so many things that are so relevant in today's world that um, they could explore. And it certainly would provide a meaty role for an actress. It would. And, and one thing I would love to see, uh, it's something that partially inspired the Luzo World Cinema Blogathon is you don't see a lot of Portuguese people or uh, or even Portuguese American people portrayed in American films. It's it's very rare. Um, not all of the portrayals that exist are accurate or positive. And with Carmen, you have the also the the factor that there are some people who who don't know she was Portuguese and just think of her as Brazilian. But Brazilian is a nationality and a cultural identity. It's not an ethnicity. ethnicity. If you think of one type of person when you think of a Brazilian, you're, you're mentally discriminating against the full uh, spectrum of Brazilian society. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a multiracial society. Um, you know, people can be any combination of ethnicity or race, or maybe in some cases, they're, they're just a, a single one. There are cl clusters, like there's the Italian cluster in Brazil and the German cluster in Brazil, but, but overall, it, you know, it, it, is a, it is a much more mixed society than, than the United States. So you can't really go what, by what people think of is, is or who should look like a, a stereotypical uh, Latinx or Latino or Latina. Um, it, it's, it's a diverse society. And it would be nice to see somebody who is Portuguese 
or you know a Brazilian culturally or a citizen get to play uh, Carmen um, because it so rarely happens that somebody who is any of those things gets to portray it. I mean, you even look at what's happening right now with that Aaron Sorkin, Lucy and Desi production. There are so many talented uh, Cuban American actors who could play that part, um, but they are casting from Spain to get a well-known movie name in instead. So I, I totally get how um, Cuban Americans wish somebody with their background gets to play one of their most famous people. And I've got to say about the food for a minute, this was really good. Like, I, again, I love finding new things to eat and enjoy. And I'm kind of, like I said, I'm glad I didn't use a lot of sugar. It's very, very light. It's lime. I, you know, I know you said it was like a dessert pudding kind of thing. I would almost like want to grill up some chicken and like have some rice chicken and this is another side dish. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. Like, or you could dip carrots in it or celery or an appetizer, or pita chips. Like, I'm just thinking of like the different ways this could be incorporated as opposed to just being a dessert, you know? And, and I think that's our American association. We associate avocado with savory. <laughs> yeah, I definitely do. I mean, I'm always putting avocado on my sandwiches all the time or in tortilla soup. Yeah, I definitely see it as savory, but Again, I don't like when there's so much sugar in something that it's so, you know, like there's a smoothie place here in LA and I kind of stopped going because their smoothies are just like a glass of bubble gum. And I just, you know what I mean? Sometimes too much sugar can kind of ruin something. So, but yeah, I can totally see this as a multi-purpose thing if you cut down on the sugar for like, you know, different purposes with your food. Well, in, in one of our friends, um... Anna Roland, hello Anna. Um, <laughs> she said that she was going to uh, use it to make a batida, which is an alcoholic uh, beverage uh, from Brazil. Yeah, I think this is a very multi purpose item, actually, which I love things that can be very versatile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so no more questions? Wow, I think we're pretty timely then, if there are. Again, that's a. Why is my phone doing this? Hang on, my phone is acting weird. Let's see. Oh, well also, you know what? I should take a moment um, to thank the, the bloggers who participated in the Luzo World Cinema Blogathon. Yes. First off, um, when I wanted to do the blogathon, I was really excited to do it and I could have just done it myself, but I thought, no, I, I would like this to feel um, like a community, that, that, that it's not just getting people to get sign on and, and write about things, but also that people who have a connection to Lusitanic cultures to, to run the blogathon with me. So I contacted two people who are bloggers that have Lusitanic uh, backgrounds, and one of them, uh, Leticia Malgues from Critica Retro, she said yes. So she's been my co-host um, and co-founder on, on the Blogathon. And uh, Lei lives in uh, Brazil, so she brings a Brazilian perspective to the Blogathon as well. And she's been so good with, with sh uh, sharing the work and promoting it and getting people excited. So I'm very thankful to her for, for working with me on it. And then uh, Gil from Real Ouija Midget Reviews, uh, she has participated in the blogathon two years in a row. She wrote about The Devil's Advocate because it stars Keanu Reeves. And one of the very common things is that with people who have Hawaiian backgrounds, they often also have Portuguese backgrounds. And so Keanu Reeves' father, amongst his uh, Hawaiian and European heritages, has um, a Portuguese background. That's because um, the Portuguese from Madeira and the Azores immigrated to seek opportunity on the plantations in Hawaii and as cowboys out in Hawaii. Make sure you have a few more questions, which while you're answering a question in a second here, I'm gonna run and get the battery because my computer's running very low. Um, okay, Carol Airy says, Benjamin and I want to know if Carmen chose her own image of the fruit headdress. Oh yes, she definitely chose her own image. So 
she was inspired by what women were doing in real life, but there was an ag exaggerated theatrical um, presentation to to what she did. And it, it's so funny because if you watch Carmen on that episode of the Jimmy Durante show, when she's dancing with Jimmy, the turban she has is piled so high with fruit that at times she's putting her hand on her head to make sure the turban doesn't fall off. And so that um, ab abundance of fruit was part of her evolution of the look. And, and that was something, something that she picked, that she designed, that she wanted to do. And Robin Searway says, who did she like to work with as a male actor? Also, what was her favorite film that she was in? Oh my goodness, well, um, I don't know what her, famous, her favorite film was, but I do know that Carmen had an eye for the gentleman. And so there were a number of men that she worked with who were infatuations or cru crushes. Her husband was the one that we know um, she took it to the next level with, but amongst the men she liked was John Payne. <laughs> okay. And we don't know what her favorite film was. I'm not sure what her favorite film was, no. I, st I would have to do more, more research on that. Um, I feel like I, I've, I've read a lot of Carmen over the years increasingly, but I still have a lot of research I can do on her. There's just so much written ab about her. Um, and again, with some of the books out there being um, out of print or with some of the texts being ac academic, there's some hunting to find the kind of information you want to find. You know, it sounds like she's ripe for reprisal and ripe for a brand new fresh look in our modern times and a new biography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, 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 could, that could happen, definitely. Um, and every time a star is revived for a biography, um, the way the culture has changed, it always results in us taking a, a new look at them and, and, and making a reevaluation. Um, and also maybe we have some more information now than, than, we, they, when, than we did back then too. Well, this has been so much fun, Beth, and thank you so much for joining me. I feel like I learned a heck of a lot about Carmen Miranda tonight. Oh, before we sign off, can I just finish saying thank you sure. to the bloggers? Okay, I'm going to go through it really fast, but oh, I will sorry. Take all time you want. say thanks to Rich from Widescreen World. This year, he wrote about the two popes. Thanks to Terrence from A Shroud of Thoughts. This time, he wrote about O Patio des Cantigas. And then also thanks to, let's see, Rebecca Denniston for the writing about the gangs all here, Ruth from Silver, Silver Screenings for writing about Louise Fazenda, um, famous as a silent film comedian, but she did make the transition to sound. Uh, thank you to Sally Silver Screen at 18 Cinema Lane for reviewing Ladies in Lavender to cover Daniel Bru. Now, um, his last name is German, but he has a, a connection to the Ger German Brazilian community. And also, thank you to J Dub from Dub Dubsism. He reviewed Apollo 12 because of Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks's mom was a Portuguese American. Also, thanks to uh, Dan um, from Crimson Kimono. Dan really brings a, a, a perspective to the blogathon that I like. Um, his last name is Akiro, and uh, last year he wrote about uh, a Brazilian film, uh, Gajin, that concentrates on the Japanese in Brazil. And a lot of people don't know this, but the number two country for having a, a Japanese population um, after Japan is Brazil. And so this year, he, he focused on um, films from East Timor. Um, that area used to be colonized um, by Portugal. Um, and then uh, I wrote about Casa de Lava. Um, it's not translated, but retitled for American audiences as Down to Earth. And that is a Portuguese film um, set in Cape Verde, or Cabo Verde, 
um, that's inspired by uh, Jacques Tourneur's I Walked with a Zombie. Um, both films deal with uh, colonization and, and the impact. And yes, and then also Leigh had had her blogathon posts that she did as well. So thanks again for not only helping to run the blogathon, but also participating in it too. And so thanks, Carrie, for giving me the chance to say thank you to everybody who participated. I'll put a link when you post a video. I'll put a link to the to where people can catch the blogathon entries if they want to learn more or if they want to see the the review uh, pertaining to Carmen Miranda. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Beth. I learned a lot. This was really interesting. Oh, and good. I'm glad. Stay tuned for more fun and food from Hollywood Kitchen. Thanks so much for having me, Carrie. Thank you. It was fun. Bye.